All right. Hey, everybody, and welcome to two Dynamite Dudes. That's two. You see my brother gesturing. Ah, that's four, Dom. Wrong. Oh, yeah, there you go. Two Dynamite Dudes with Attitudes. Uh, my name is Marcus D'Angelo, not of WrestleZone.com. Nope. Uh, but I am joined by my slapdick brother, Dominic D'Angelo, who is of WrestleZone.com. Dominic, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Uh, you know, just uh, this is an immediate uh uh, episode that we're doing right off the bat and then that might just stop airing right now so it, yeah yeah it is it's it's a week it's a week night uh i'm i'm ready to i'm i'm gassed i'm ready to tap out but for you folks uh dominic and i are gonna do a uh do a quick one oh there's the american dream baby yes baby we had a little bashaw last week now we got dusty <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, as uh, these next guys are no Dusty Rhodes, but I'll tell you what, man, they they put on quite a match tonight. Uh, uh, Brian Cage and uh, and his opponent's name again. It remind me, Dom. It's horrible. Oh, Will Hobbs. Will Hobbs. I am I am the fucking worst. But uh, both guys, great match. Uh, you know, they put on they put on like a really good classic kind of a big man match. Um, but what I thought was really cool and interesting about it was that Brian Cage kind of showed that he can do, he's like sort of a finesse player. Like he can do a little bit of everything. It, he showed that he could do the big man match where it's like the shoulder bumps and the hitting the ropes and trying to knock each other loose. Uh, but then he also did like some of his finesse stuff and he, he landed a nice backflip, which I'm not really crazy about, but man, the, like in general, I'm not crazy about it, but I thought it was cool seeing a guy like him do it, especially after like all the big man spots. Um, you know, so it sort of led up to that moment. And yeah, man, uh, I'm I'm a big Brian Cage guy. I'm glad that he went over. I think it was the right move. And uh, they managed to further the storyline. Go figure. Yeah, Brian Cage, uh, he's a one of a kind kind of wrestler. Like he's got the that big guy look, but he's also able to do so much of that cool, like innovative stuff like that one. Uh, it was like a face buster that was inverted or something that was it looked awesome. Like, yeah, it was like a pump, pump handle. handle. Pump yeah. handle face buster. But, like, uh, yeah, Cage has been, it. like, I remember the first match I ever saw Brian Cage do was a Lucha Underground match against him and Willie Mack. Both guys, big guys that can high fly like crazy. And so it was awesome. So, like, seeing him be able to do that against Will Hobbs, who I thought had a great showing, too, it was a really good way to open the show uh, and, like, have Team Taz out there. And um, kind of get, I, I was happy that Cage went over because, you know, uh, the FTW title has kind of been understated, like not showing up, you know, recently and stuff like that, not made note of. So I thought uh, having Cage get a win and uh, keeping the title, it didn't harm Willie Hobbs at all. And I think uh, Cage just came out looking like a bigger, bigger features, featured player in AEW. So, yeah, I thought it was a good match. Good opener. I you know I, I like the idea of having the FTW title there. I don't like the AEW acknowledges it. It should, in my opinion, it it would be a real heel thing to just say like, no, we're the champions. We're the FTW like FTW champion right here, Brian Cage, and then like say that he's defending it. But even when he loses, he just like grabs it and walks out at the end. Like I would prefer that over AEW acknowledging it kind of as a championship. But well, it's still, it's I don't cool. think technically they're recognizing it as a title. But, like, they did announce it was for, like, the FTW title. Right, and, and they're, like, like putting it over during the match. So, yeah, like, to me, they should, they should, oh, the, the announcer should always be saying, like, this is not one of our titles. This is something that Tash just brought in. It's not like, you know, you can just, like, Tully Blanchard, you could just, like, walk in and be like, this is the title now. And it's like, <laughs> as long as these guys and acknowledge it. Like, it's, it, you know, that part doesn't really make much sense to me, but... I love the FTW title. I love Team Taz, uh, and you know I'm I'm excited to see where things go for Brian Cage. He's another one of those guys, man. Sky's the limit. Like it, like you and I said, can work a number of fashions. So he's he's fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see where they go with him. Uh, and I hate to use the word interesting. I think it's gonna be really really cool to see where they go with him. To uh, yeah, just moving forward on and how they utilize him and like. Like I say, Team Taz is awesome. It's a, I think it's my favorite. It's my favorite faction in wrestling right now. So uh, I don't think they can do a whole lot of wrong in my eyes at this point in time. I couldn't agree more, Dom. And you know, uh, as as I've stated many numerous times, 
there's there's a tag team that, in my opinion, can do no wrong, and that's FTR. And they had the next match against uh, Hybrid. What are they? What? Uh, TH2. So he yeah, the Hybrid 2. Uh-huh. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, and by the way, I you know those two are pretty fun to watch, even during their entrance. You know, they, they kind of smarmy sort of dance into the ring. And then, you know, Jack Evans doing some pretty incredible uh, gymnastics uh, out there. It was it was something it was quite a thing to watch. You know, ordinarily, you know me, Dom, I'm, I'm more into the traditional wrestling. But what was really cool about it, what, what made the match between them so awesome, in my opinion, was that, uh, you know, they they had something that's been missing in modern professional wrestling. And that's storytelling. Um, and, and they told the story. The story was... And JR put it over. The story is uh, FTR. Uh, the The enemy for FTR is speed. They want to they want a slow methodical match. So these guys are like a tough opponent for them in that regard. And then it's also cut off the ring. Uh, make yeah. sure that they can't get to their tag team partner. And so you know, masterful storytelling. Uh, it was. I thought it was a great match. These are two great matches opening up the show, and uh, I was I was pretty blown away. What about you? Yeah, I liked it. I like. Uh, TH2, I like, uh, I keep thinking, like, if you were a kid and you saw the color schemes that they would come out with wearing and stuff like that, they would be immediately uh, one of your favorite teams. Like, it's just like, I just imagine 90s, seven-year-old Dom being like, oh, those, those guys are great. You know, I like the looks of those guys and everything. And then obviously the move set. Um, it's kind of, I really want them, uh... <laughs> I remember when they first kind of debuted, or they were on Lucha Underground too, and like Jack Evans would be like hanging out with a cigarette and all that stuff. I almost wanted to have that kind of vibe going again. But uh, I think overall, be- yeah, overall, like I thought they, I thought you know, different, very different styles, but they complemented one another very well in the ring. And um, both, obviously, both teams know what they're doing. So, and that says a lot. And having Tully out there, too, playing that underhanded manager and everything like that, like, the, like kind of making the playing field unfair in a lot of ways. And then, yeah, you mentioned, the, like, the, the storytelling aspect. We had the ring psychology of Evans with his hurt ankle and uh, that playing a factor into it. And then they also talked about him having his jaw worked on and everything like that broken. And so they played in that a little bit. There was a little bit of a missed uh, move by Evans, like they're doing that spinning leg drop off the top. But I thought he handled it real well by just going back up and doing another move. Like, so. Definitely. Um, Definitely. It's just, just like a veteran move where you just don't, like, move, like, you don't miss a move or botch a move and then you guys play it off like they hit it. Like, you just went back and did a different move, you know? It's, so, it's the, right, the right thing to do. You're absolutely yeah. right. And yeah, you know, it, like, there were a couple spots in the match that I thought were, were pretty contrived, like, you know, the whole like, you know, trying to sweep the legs underneath the uh, the rope and he jumps over them. Like you can see that stuff coming like as as he gets down to do like squat and start to sweep the leg. I'm like, oh, he's about to jump his leg and he just does it. It's like that, that kind of stuff I could do without, you know, but, you know, you can tell that FTR is working with these people. You know, they have a very specific style, but they're like, you know, get your shit into you know, we'll get our shit in, and they're 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 being agreeable and helping to work with people. I do like that they call people uh, backyard wrestlers and stuff. Uh, I find that very entertaining. Um, and and again, it furthers their storyline. Their storyline is this is how we work, and we're very slow. We're methodical. We'll pick you apart, and it doesn't matter what kind of crazy flips you do or whatever. We are going to beat you. And I think that that's that's a storyline that we can all sink our teeth into. Dom, something I'm having a very hard time sinking my teeth into is the young bucks. What what the hell is going on? Uh, so, so you tell me, Dom. What what do you think is happening? I have zero clue, man. Zero idea. And you know, it's like going in from week in and week out. We don't get more of a further answer. It's just them being like smarmy and super kicking uh, random people that they shouldn't be super kicking, and then and kind of is- like playing it off like, "Oh, should have done that. Uh, sorry." And it's like it's kind of funny, but it's also like. I want more of a story here. What's happening? What is going on? No, Marcus, I have no answer for this. This is this is like this isn't like intri- or, uh, mysterious in like an intriguing way. This is mysterious in an annoying way, in my opinion. Um, and I, I'm not even going to call it mysterious anymore. I think I kind of got it figured out, Dominic. You remember uh, Shawn Michaels and DX uh, in the in the early or mid 2000s? 
um, he was like backstage and he would get he like got really mad about something and just super kicked a guy who was walking past and yes. flying uh-huh. in the air. I think that they saw that and they were just like, "That's hilarious! It's a funny, funny thing to do to somebody." And I want to do that as a baby face. So the way that they're, I think that they're pushing this thing. If, if you can wrap your mind around it, Dominic, the way that they're doing it is they're saying we are doing this as baby faces, but we're just like we're fiery and we're upset. Um, you know, like we're we're very frustrated with how things have been going here, and so like as baby faces, we're just taking it out on people, and it's funny because I think to them it's like they have a personal relationship with Tony Schiavone, so it's like oh Tony's hilarious, it's funny for us to super kick Tony Schiavone. Whereas for you and I, I see that, and I remember the guy you know who's like the voice of my childhood. And I'm like that's go home heat with me when I see that kind of stuff. This is so to me not fiery. It's it's not baby face. It is annoying. And uh, and so to me, they're heels. And again, they're very clearly building toward this feud between them and FTR. So they have to be baby faces. Well, Marcus, I I see where you're going, Brett, but I don't think that they think that they're baby faces. Like because if you listen to the commentary and everything like that too, it pushes back against them. Like it does say, like, hey, they can't be doing this. And even Jr. himself is like, they should be suspended. They can't keep doing this shit. It's like too much so they know their heels i just don't know where the hell they're going with it that's all i think i don't um, know like tony shivani was kind of no selling it as far as like yeah it was wrong for them well, to tony do- shivani's a, the, he's the good guy he's the good cop and like everything like that he likes he likes everybody he likes Britt baker who's a heel clear heel stuff like that so i don't i don't like subscribe to that too much honestly man they're heels they know their heels but i don't think I just don't know what the hell they're doing and where it's going and how the payoff is going to happen here. Yeah, whatever they're doing, Dominic, it's annoying me. And it's I, I don't find well, it... Well, I mean, maybe to that extent, uh, they're kind of doing their job, but also, it's just like, give us some answers. That's what I'm looking for. I want some more answers uh, with this story instead of, like, it just kind of, like, being teased here and here and here each week, you know? I guess. I, I don't think payoff. That. And what is the payoff? That's why I'm not, I don't, I have zero clue as to where it's going. I can't say I'm a, like, fan of it because, like, I prefer having clear-cut baby faces versus clear-cut heels. Um, but I don't know, man. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah, and, you know, if if they are going for the funny baby face thing, it is not funny in the least. I think Matt Jackson is not a good actor, um, and so that's not coming off very well. Um, it just overall, uh, le- it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth week, week after week. I'm very, very out on the bucks right now. Um, Dominic, another thing I'm kind of out on, I wanted to get your opinion on this. So FTR and Best Friends, uh, kind of a cool thing with like the t-shirts are coming out. They're, they're like building animosity between these two teams. But again, just like the dog collar match, uh, they're giving it away on free TV next week. Uh, and to me, that's a head scratcher uh, under these circumstances. Why? Why would you give away like they're they've been spending a couple weeks now building this angle between them. They come out with the the mocking t-shirts, you know, FTR takes a powder at the end of the segment. Like, you know, they're they're building towards something that could sell tickets, you know, in in a pre-COVID world. Um why why are they giving this away on free TV? I think you got to look at it from more of a a perspective that they don't have that many like pay-per-view shows a year. So, I mean, uh, and, and this one coming up is the anniversary show. So that's has it on a more, on a more highlighted stage, I guess. And, um, so I think, you know, I don't really think, I think the best friends, uh, will be solid contenders for them, but yeah, I think there's more, we're going to get more story from FTR and their journey with the titles. So, um, you know, it's going to be a competitive match next week. I, uh, and like, j- this is like one of those storylines that aren't, isn't a very, very long term storyline. I think it's, you know, it makes sense from the ideal that they won their street fight and it was a memorable street fight. So, um, and then they're playing into this. So, this is the first kind of, uh, you know, they're going to quote unquote do like the NWA tour that Ric Flair did you know, back in the day where, you know, this is the baby faces that they're going up against. They're going to win somehow under early and then move on to the next one and build more momentum to 
uh, whoever they're facing, whether that's the Young Bucks and I, again, what the hell is happening? But <clears throat> we're just, it's just this is a temporary, this is a short term storyline, I think. So that's why. All right. Well, you know, I just think that they could do more with it, especially with the best friends coming off a big angle like that that kind of epic match in the parking lot. You know, um, that they're coming off as the winners of, you know, uh, what Dave Meltzer, I believe, called a five star match, which I think is kind of absurd. Um, uh, so they're coming off as the winners of that match. They're coming into a, an angle that's that's, you know, kind of building in heat. And and we're just going to give it away. You know, I get it. It's the anniversary. We should do something special for the anniversary. But I don't know. It's uh, to me, again, missed opportunity. Um, I'm not crazy about the idea, but, you know, is what it is, Dominic. Um, uh, next up, uh, man, uh, it's probably the best match I've seen in AEW since Cody and uh, since Cody took on his brother at uh, the first AEW event. Uh, man, that was uh, Mr. Brody Lee and, and Cody in a uh, dog collar match, Dominic. And man, uh, the the stage was set. They were they were building it up all night. They were making references to the original match. And then during the match, uh, we see Greg the Hammer Valentine, the man himself who participated in that match. Uh, they're they're at ringside. Man, it was like the 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 setting was elect- electric, and both guys they uh, they lived up all, to all the hype. What did you think? I liked it a lot, and uh, I tweeted that out too. But I feel uh, like um, it may, and just seeing the dog call it the chain and everything, like it made it dangerous. Like you felt that hey, these guys, and like there's moments where they're like getting tangled in the chain. They're uh, you know Cody's trying to leap over the chain where it's like getting in, it, like mixed up into their their match. <laughs> like it's playing a factor and like they said like uh it's an inanimate object Dara said it's an inanimate object you cannot control it and it really played into that but i mean the athleticism and the balance that these guys you know them able to work around it and uh, make those adjustments and make the match brutal as hell was uh, i just i really liked it a lot you know and that's coming from me and this goes across the board like I, I, I'm I, glad you're on the show with me because you're able to assess the match, like, thoroughly while I'm, like, looking up, looking down, looking up, looking down. But even even from that, uh, you know, motion of me doing that, uh, I still really enjoyed the match and got everything out of it that I think that they were kind of, you know, conveying to the audience. So uh, really liked the match a lot, uh, you know, um, yeah, and that's something that you cannot do all the time, but when they did it, it really meant something. And they, they went all out having the hammer and Valentine there. Everything stakes were on the line. So. Incredibly, incredibly high stakes. And, you know, uh, I always kind of use my wife as a barometer on on uh, these wrestling shows. You know, I've, I've been watching wrestling for so long, so have you. You know, I think that sometimes my opinion can be jaded, but... You know, as we were watching the show, uh, she was like, that seems like such a terrible idea. I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, it's kind of cool, isn't it? You know, it's and I, I sort of explained the storyline and how uh, Brody Lee really whooped on him before. So kind of in theory, the last thing you would want to do is have a chain attached to you and this guy that, that completely whooped your ass. Yeah. But, uh, but she kind of broke it down in, in the most simplistic way. But like it, as simple as it was, I was like, that's a pretty incredible way to think of things. She was like, it would make it very easy for you to break your neck. Uh, having a dog collar attached to a chain attached to another human. Um, she was like, that's, that seems like a very dangerous thing for these performers to be doing. And I was like, you know what? You kind of hit the nail on the head. Like ex- exactly. And that's, I mean, these are the stakes. These guys are like kind of out for blood. And it was like high stakes match. Uh, again, as you said, good balance. They did a good job working with the chain. Uh, you know, it's, it's not always going to cooperate, but they forced it to some really crazy spots. I like that both guys got juice. I, I even like the sort of kind of silly stuff with John Silver there at the beginning. Where yeah. he just kicked the hell out of him on that chair. Yeah. Which is pretty incredible. Was it? Now, see, this is where I was looking down. Was it Brody that forced him to sit down? I think so. I like. Okay. I want to. I want to say if that's the case. Like he saw yeah. that he was bleeding or something. He was like, "Have a seat" or whatever. And Cody just like plows him over. Plows through. So, yeah, it was something like that. But it was it was something to see. And man, the whole match, great spectacle. And uh, you know, this is one of those moments in in pro wrestling. You know, like akin to uh, 
to like yeah, Jake the Snake and and uh, the model Rick Martel in the blindfold match, you know, akin to uh, the Undertaker, Mick Foley, Hell in a Cell, like it, with these iconic moments, the original dog collar match, like all these iconic moments. I feel like this is one of those for AEW, and uh, it was cool to watch it unfold. Yeah, it was neat. It was really neat. What did you think um, of Brody Lee losing? And then uh, follow up with that. What did you think of Orange Cassidy getting the challenge next week to Cody? Well, as far as Brody losing, uh, I I sort of saw it coming down the pike. It was the only thing that really made sense uh, with a with a returning top baby face is for uh, for him to get the win. So I was fine with it. Um, I don't think it hurt Brody, you know, especially after such a great match like that. I don't think it did. And you know, the fact that it was a stipulation match, I think, also helps Brody's uh, character in that, like, hey, if this was a straight up match, like, I would tear you apart. But you got lucky this time with this chain. You know, you were able to use it against me. So I think that that protected Brody in many respects. Um, yeah, I, you know, I actually have it in my notes here. Um, you know, Cody saying that he wanted to defend the championship uh, uh, next week. I was like, all right. And, you know, it's like I knew it was the anniversary episode. And I'm like, oh, man, like this is like the fact that he's doing this announcement right after the match. It's got to be a pretty big angle. Right. And so, you know, uh, I was I'm, I'm sitting there thinking like, uh, what if it's like Matt Cardona? You know, like they'll bring him back for another match. That would be uh-huh. cool. Like, him and his good friend. I was like, oh, what if it's like a legend? And I was like, I pumped the brakes. But what if it's CM Punk? And so, like all these, all these thoughts like rushed through my head, and then Orange Can- Orange Cassidy came out, and I was a little bit like, oh, <laughs> like oh, okay. Um, so like it's cool, you know. I know that Orange Cassidy is pretty over with that crowd, um, so it, like it's it's fine. Just like the silliness uh, after such a serious, like Cody's in the ring and he's like getting emotional and it's like a very, very serious moment. They had this epic, epic match where it's like, as I said, it's going to be something that's like in the history books of AEW, I think 20, 30 years from now. Um, And then it's like Orange Cassidy comes out and he gives his like weird halfway thumbs up. (laughs) And I was just like, come on. like I'll hold up the hand for somebody to like bump with. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm just like, you kind of like killed that moment a little bit with that silliness, but I understand why they did it. You know, it's two big stars and they want to feature them on the, the anniversary episode. Uh, I will tell you this, Dominic, uh, Cody Rhodes had better not be one of those intermediate champions that just like takes the belt to drop the belt to somebody else. I hope that's not the case. Uh, Cody Rhodes needs to go over in this match. Yeah, you think so? I'm kind of, I'm kind of either way with it at the moment. Um, I can see it going at it, like both either way, but uh, yeah, I think this is kind of maybe where a little bit of your jadedness comes in uh, because I feel um, like with Orange Cassidy coming out, you know, he obviously he he's got a lot of he's a humorous character and has some of that stuff to it, but I think throughout the weeks we've kind of he's kind of created a further uh, build to himself as being like. A real competitor in the ring and like not only with like babyface fire but like the 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 punches and the shots that he takes and everything like that mixed in i think it puts him to that level of like okay he's we this is something that we wanted to see and that we could have envision seeing and now we're going to get it next week between these guys and I, it's not like he did something super duper hokey where he came out super lax or like was just like oh, I don't give a shit, like kind of thing like that. It was like, all right, this is how who I am, and this is how I'm reacting to it. And then Cody gives him the thumbs up. I thought it was fine, and I think it's gonna be a a really really solid match next week. And you know, I think you can totally see Cody kind of being this transitional champion in this regard for this time around. But you can also see Cody going over too, so it kind of leaves the door open for who's exactly is gonna win this match. Yeah, and, you know, that was the thing I really liked about Cody and Brody, too, is that, like, I legitimately, you know, I, I figured that Cody was going to win, but at the same time, I'm just like, it also makes, sort of makes sense for Brody to win, um, and then yeah. they kind of kick, kick the can down the road as far as the uh, the uh, feud goes. Um, but, yeah, so it's, it's good to not know, like, you kind of look at a match and be like, I don't know, I could see it going one way or the other. I don't know. It's just the whole like him coming up with the halfway thumbs up and stuff. It felt it felt a little bit like we just saw Hogan and Rock at WrestleMania, and then like Hurricane Helms comes out and does his shtick. Nah, like no, because I, I honestly I think like they built him. They, like I said, they built him up over the weeks, and like he's been established. Like he's fought Jericho three times, and 
you know, uh, has gotten over on Dark Order and stuff like that, fought Brody Lee and stuff. So, I mean, they've defined him to a, to a level of, like, the TNT title and stuff. So, uh, I don't think it's not not to that level of exactly i I guess Uh, you know agree to disagree i I think maybe he's just not quite my flavor um somebody that is my flavor though dominic serena deeb uh man she is an incredible performer um that was it was fun to watch her work i like big swole i think she's got a great look i think she has an incredible physique she's got great charisma but she is green and she is dangerous at times in the ring and you can see her being dangerous there was one spot where uh she came off the ropes and it was a very sudden uh clothesline from serena and it was pretty devastating looking clothesline uh i know that the announcers put it over right away but uh, you could see serena like checking her face and it was it was swole's uh, timing on the thing. It looked like they may have collided heads. Um, That's what. Well, they mentioned that. They mentioned that. And I'm glad I wanted to get your take on this because this was a match where I was like really like up and down at the computer like doing the coverage and stuff. So like I was not able to get a good gauge of like was it a good match? Was it was there a lot of like yeah like those mistimed spots? What exactly happened? So like yeah, give me more details on this. Yeah, there were there were mistimed spots. Um, I think that the big swole, you know, like I said, uh, with some more training and stuff, I'm sure they would have put on an incredible match. Serena Deeb is like she she's an old school like she she knows how to wrestle. Um, and I, she like the way that she moves in the ring, she looks like she she would know how to legitimately wrestle somebody as well, uh, like Greco Roman style wrestle. So like her against somebody like uh, like Ronda Rousey, Tessa Blanchard, Charlotte Flair, uh, as we saw with Thunder Rosa, people who who do have like uh, some technical prowess, uh, she she'd put on five star matches all day long. Um, you know, this one was not a five star match, um, and and it, it is due to uh, timing issues, I think. So, you know, uh, Big Swole, she's like I said, I think she's got a great future, very green right now, and dangerous. I think that they need to spend a little bit more time with her. I mean, colliding heads like they did, uh, could have. I mean, wh- what happens if uh, Serena Deep gets knocked unconscious? I mean, obviously, you go for the pin right away, but you've got this new talent, you've got this new equity uh, in her, and all all the money that you've started to dump toward her, and and storylines that you've started to think about her, and now she's been put in danger, in a dangerous position because you've put her in the ring with somebody who's not prepared for it. Um, so yeah, it's I I just don't like that aspect of it, especially because I see I see how good she is every time she wrestles. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean that's I think that's a huge reason why they signed her too. You know, yep. I mean, you look at that performance. Still, I think the the women's match of AEW is her versus Thunder Rosa. You know, unquestionably. Still, yeah, I still think that holds the the top tier of it. So yeah, no, I mean, it's something you really got to be careful with. And um, you know, uh, it's a further you want to establish these talents, and uh, you want to put these newer talents in the ring with like a stat like people that know what they're doing in the ring, but you also got to walk that fine line of knowing uh, when to be careful and how to position those people. Because, you know, if uh, Swole is going to, if Swole going to be hurting people, you got to kind of factor that in. Like she's got a great personality and a persona and not saying that she can't fix those whatsoever, like those uh, early flaws or anything like that. But um, it's a matter of like, getting those people ready for it, ready for the spotlight like that. And um, you don't want to put people in danger either. So, well, um, you know, and, and she does have an incredible look. Uh, yeah. yeah. So and the, I love her theme music. <laughs> yeah. But so there's, there's a reason that the, the Goldberg was mostly squash matches, uh, you know, because he was green. Um, so if you want to put a star, uh, a star over like, like her, no problem. You absolutely can make her squash people. I don't think she should be squashing somebody who's, who's as talented as Serena Deeb, but like have her squashing people. Go ahead. Uh, make her come out and squash some, some other t- established talent here, you know, because then that way it's a quick match. doesn't give her an opportunity to really hurt anybody. Um, and you still get her over, 
Um, so I, I, I hope that they move forward doing stuff like that. I think, I think what they saw was like, we see a talent in, in, uh, in big swole and we want to exploit that talent and Hey, who's going to get, get the best out of her more than Serena deep. And it's like the best is just not ready to come out of her yet. And Serena deep can't do anything about it. And you put Serena deep in danger by putting her in that position. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. I do. Um, yep. I don't know if you have this on your agenda, but did you did you have uh, Lance Archer's little promo that he did? I did not. I did not put anything down about that, but I thought it was good. Okay. Yeah. You, how about Moxie's promo too? Did you? Yeah. Have, yeah. I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it very much uh, John Moxley's flavor, and you know, again, it kind of establishes him as like uh, almost like an everyman. He like takes a shot at the bar at the end. I love that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was great. Uh, I, I preferred Moxley's over uh, over Lance Archer's, but I thought Lance Archer's was good, too. And, you know, again, we're building towards something here. Um, and it, I don't know. It's I they're they're very clearly positioning that for pay-per-view. Um, so why not the, these other stories that you're building along the way? Again, position them for pay-per-views. Uh, well, Marcus, that's next week, though. Like, that's next week, too. Oh, wait, they're wrestling on... Yeah, I didn't catch that part. You didn't know that? That's been yeah. They've been, they've been promoting that like crazy, Marcus. That's what the whole big thing is. Ah, uh, see, you know, I, I kind of space out Marcus. just assuming it's pay per view. Marcus, that, that's horrible. Last week, last week, you brought up Goldberg versus Hogan and how it was totally fine for them to do that on Nitro, and which I wholeheartedly disagree with. That's a pay per view, and that's a that's a promotion that had monthly pay per views, monthly. This only has what six pay per views a year. So Dom, let's let's give a little context here. If John Moxley and Lance Archer were fighting in front of a crowd of sixty five thousand people or seventy thousand people, um, as as Goldberg and Hogan did at the what is it the the Falcon Georgia Dome. Dome? Yeah, the Georgia Dome down there. Um, no problem because again, you're building you're building. Uh, something greater than than pay per view revenue. You're you're building toward merchandising. You're building toward establishing stars. As I said, uh, WC Eric Bischoff has laid out the numbers on his podcast as far as the amount of money that they made following that that event, and it paid off in incredible dividends more than any any single pay per view ever could. Dom doing a match like this at Daly's place in front of mostly your own roster, uh, it's a waste. Uh, it's a waste, especially during a time when AEW wants to put up uh, intriguing things on their pay-per-views, things that people want to spend money for. They've been building toward this angle for a long time. Um, why not exploit it and make some extra money? Doesn't make Here's sense. the thing. Uh, uh, a bit more of a difference. Uh, like there is uh, Goldberg was very, very established at that point as a rising star and a top, top person uh, in, the, in the wrestling industry in 98. Uh, Hogan, obviously, was the biggest wrestling star there is. So you had that uh, going into it. Lance Archer's relatively new to the mainstream wrestling scene. And um, he's had matches with Cody. He's definitely a, a presence. But you want to further build him more. Um, the, the way to do that. And Moxley is already an established star. But certainly not to the level that Hogan was in 98 at all. So um, to have these guys go against each other on uh, your mainstream television wrestling product, I think makes way more sense than what happened at the Superdome in 1998 of July. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a good, perfect enough reason to have them fight each other next week. And I, this is a match, too, where I just don't I, – I don't know who's going to win it. I could totally see Archer winning it. And um, – Moxie almost kind of set him up for that in the promo that he had. Because he was like, everybody dies. Uh, I'm going to lose this title one way or another. So at some point, he's like, anytime I give it. Which, I, it's just an awesome promo. Like, you know, Cornette can give Moxie all this shit in the world. Like, about, like, being fake so cold. Nothing. Moxie is his own guy. I've said that before. And uh, I still feel it, you know. So. Um, I agree. I yeah. agree. It's um, a. But yeah, I think uh, I don't know who's going to win that next week. Yeah, I mean, you know, I and again, to me, that's why you that's why you put it on pay per view because like he's had it for uh, Moxley's had it long enough that fans are starting to think like, okay, anytime he gets into a, a new program, this could be it. This could be the one where he loses. 
uh, the title. So it's like, I know, you know, for me personally, let's say I had a bunch of expendable income and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big AEW fan. I see it. They've got this pay-per-view and I'm like, man, you know, Moxley's had that title for a long time and they're trying to put Archer over like, I think I'm going to buy this pay-per-view. Like, I want to see how this thing plays out, you know? So to me, that's, that's why it's a missed opportunity. But I, I, I again, I see your point. I, th- I think it's a little column A, a little column B. So uh, agree to disagree. Uh, one thing I will not allow you to dis- to disagree with me on, Dom, though, is uh, the main event. Now, look, I have softened on my stance uh, when it comes to Luther over the past week. Uh, I get it, okay? Like, you saw I- the video? Did you see that video I sent you? Sure. Sure. Okay. If I, if I had a good friend, if I had a if I had a close friend who I grew up in the business with or whatever, of course I would want to put. Say you had me, okay? Uh, I said a friend. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, let's say you had someone like me. Okay. That uh, not very athletic, uh, not uh, great storyteller, amazing. Uh, Amazing, uh, just personality and everything like that. Uh, We're not but, describing Luther right now. Okay. Well, uh, but yeah, okay. You have a friend that you're able to do this to, uh, and like it's a, a monumental in, for your own personal reason. The reason that they're having this uh, event is because of you. So uh, you can kind of you do have that option to kind of pick who you want. Um, all right, keep going. Yeah, like, you know, so that's why I've softened, where it's like, you know, of course you'd want to help out your friend. But, you know, the thing is, there's there's different times and different places for it. You know, Luther has mostly been featured on AEW Dark, uh, not at all established. So this means nothing to the casual wrestling fan flipping through. Um, you know, whereas, like, the here's a, here's a good example. Um, the Young Bucks uh, versus Jericho and Hager, I think, could have been an interesting main event. There's a lot of there's a lot of people now that know who the Young Bucks are just because of their social media following, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that would have been a much bigger uh, main event and, again, a much bigger win for for Jericho and Hager. Who did Jericho beat on the 30th? He beat Serpenico and he beat Luther, two guys mainly featured on AEW Dark. So does nothing for Jericho because he beat them. It does nothing for them. It, there's no point to it other than he wanted to get his friend a payday, which I understand. Um, I just, I don't agree with. No, I'm, I am with you though. I mean, uh, from like, I thought the Judas effect was great, um, at the end, um, and everything like that. And, but yeah, I mean, just, uh, if you were going to build to this match, there should have been a little bit more build to it. And there wasn't like, all we had was last week, suddenly they start brawling with one another. And then you don't you don't hear anything from Luther either. Like he doesn't say anything. You don't get his side of the story. Like I know it's Jericho's thirtieth, but I mean there's there hasn't been any establishment to Luther on your weekly television product. You know uh, maybe there has been some more on Dark, but we don't see it. Like a lot of people don't see that. You know YouTube gets its fair shares of views certainly, but like to the extent of TNT primetime television, no. So, yes, I'm with you. I didn't think the match itself was that late. There was just the time spots again. There's that tele- the telegraph guys and things like that where it's uh, – it just did not – from a match perspective, no. Uh, but, like, you – I mean, you have Jericho, you have Hager there, um, and it's Jericho's sh- big show. So, um it, I, I get it, but yeah, I am with you that, you know, the match itself and uh, having them as opponents without ever being established either for the most part until this week did not lend itself to, to help the match. Um, what did you think about all the tributes Jericho got? I thought they were pretty cool and really elevated the program, like elevated AEW as a program with all the, the top, like really big names in uh the celebrity world kind of thing you know yeah and a mixture of them too had had you wondering who was going to show up next uh which is which is great intrigue i thought that paul stanley uh looked pretty weird um but aside aside from that a lot uh, of the rocks all rock stars looked weird i thought <laughs> yeah yeah they're, they're all starting to look a little strange uh but no it, it was cool man it was it was cool to see that great to see lance storm who by the way would have made a great main event opponent okay. for chris jericho Stuck yeah. up in Canada, though. 
Right. Uh, that's the only place he'll travel, pal. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, I, I thought that that was cool. Um, yeah. It, a dragon. That was awesome. dra- great to see him. Uh, so, there was yeah. another guy. There was somebody else, too, that was like, oh, that's great to see, too. Well, I can't remember. Like, it was DDP and... Uh, yes. And, uh, damn, it was that one guy. Uh, he, he wound up being Cyrus, I think. Oh, Don Callis. Yes. yes. Don that Callis. Was cool. I yes. thought it was Michael Keaton at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, i mean it, it was great and all, overall you know I'll, I'll give it the old uh rating dominic by the way that that match uh brody versus cody that is a 10 star match for me 10 that, star that is a that is a 10 star on melter scale or just your own scale of like how we do it well, out of well, 10? melter scale it would be a five star match okay. uh for me well. and my skill because i'm out of 10 it's a, it's a ten. It, the, like that match is everything I'm looking for in a professional wrestling match. It was very engaging. Um, I loved it. So I thought they did a great job with it. Um, and as far as the uh, program itself, uh, you know, the rating, I, uh, dude, it was it was a good show. You know, uh, I thought the main event may have actually been the weakest part of the show, um, to be honest. Uh, which which is a shame. You know, the main event was featuring Jericho after 30 years, and it wound up being probably the weakest part of the show. I'm going to give this program a uh, solid, very solid 8.8 this week, Dominic. Oh, well, that's yeah. quite the leap from last week. It is. It quite is. Quite the leap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the... I... Okay, yeah, that, I think that's pretty fair, but this is your segment. I can't give my reading. I thought it was a great show, though. I mean, overall, it was a great show. Um, just makes me excited for next week, too, to see what exactly happens with... All the title matches they have on the line, they got the two. Hey, we didn't even mention Arn giving a spine buster for Pete's sake. That's oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, always great to see stuff like that happen. I also love that Arn uh, got a gut shot and he had to sell. I thought that, that was fun. Yes. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was uh, it was a great program, Dom. Um, I'm very satisfied with it. I think AEW is uh, trending upwards. Uh, I think that they need to polish some stuff like particularly the Young Bucks and letting Jericho do apparently whatever the hell he wants. Um, but, yeah, no, I thought it was great. The MJF segment at the end, I, you know, obviously always entertaining. Um, it felt a little bit like the uh, Rock, This Is Your Life moment. Life, yeah, with the clown, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, he got a hell of a Judas effect, though, which was entertaining. <laughs> he really did. I, <laughs> I was like, holy shit, he might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh so yeah, good good stuff. Yeah, no, I liked it. Uh expect and they pulled a fast one on us too because I was like, oh man, that's gonna really alter the course, but then they were like, Oh, you got me, that kind of thing. So um, I was uh, Dom, I was convinced. I was convinced when MJF came out, I was like, This is it, he's gonna be the leader of the Dark Order. Or not the Dark Order, uh, the inner circle. inner circle. I was I was expecting a huge beat down of Jericho there. Um but uh, so obviously it was the right thing to do, so they didn't do it. Um, but no, uh, again, eight point eight. That's that's a hell of a win, uh, as far as I'm concerned. High praise in my book. Yeah, no, it's, it was a good show, and um, yeah, man, thirty years of Jericho it was uh, Prince was kind of cool to see all. Like I said, all those celebrity appearances, and um, yeah, main, main event definitely needed some work and. Uh, just uh, maybe a re- little bit of a readjustment with a lot of like who was in it and everything, but you know, I mean, it, the show wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Jericho anyway. So I mean, it kind of kind of leads to this point where we understand it and get it, but I just didn't like you know, yeah, it was a little left to be desired, but still, still, you know, still a big highlight of having Jericho in there. I I st- like that's a, the reason he's the boardwalk on the Monopoly board for me. So. That's um, it, man. Yep, but no Monopoly this week. We'll get it next week. Uh, you know, you're on Baby Watch, so we got to, uh, you know, we're even going over right now. So, um, Marcus, how do they follow you on Twitter? You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus P. D'Angelo. Come check me out. I, uh, I, I've i been a little bit more. I've, I've been adding a little bit more here and there uh, than just simply sharing Cowboys stuff. Actually, you have live comments during Cowboys games, uh, airing my frustrations. Oh, great. So, yeah, by all means, you can enjoy that. Dominic, how do they follow you on the Twitter? You can follow me on the Twitter at Dominic D'Angelo. Follow WrestleZone on Twitter at WrestleZone.com. Go to WrestleZone.com for all your wrestling news needs. 
You can read the AEW Dynamite results I just scribed up right before we did this podcast. And speaking of podcasts, you can follow us at WrestleZone Podcast. Just type that in your podcast feed of choice. You should pop right up. You not only get two Dynamite Dudes with Attitude, but you get the re- newly named WrestleZone Wrap-Up. Instead, it used to be the WrestleZone Daily, now it's the WrestleZone Wrap-Up with Kevin Kellum and usually Robert D. Felice as his co-pilot. And heck, I just... We got a bunch of interviews on there. I just interviewed Alicia Toot today from MLW, the interview queen. Uh, we did it over video. It was great. Uh, she's one of the interviews that I've, uh, she's one of the, I think that's number three for her that I've done with her. And um, really, she gives a lot of cool insight about like kind of being able to open up as a personality on the air and everything like that. And then uh, Alexander Hammerstone uh, interviewed him this past week. Um, and yeah, more coming down the line. Uh, we have plenty of from the ROH tournament, uh, pure title tournament that's up there. Uh, Mick Foley we just interviewed. Bill Pritchard just interviewed Mick Foley. So real good stuff happening. And uh, yeah, man, it's uh, it was a great show tonight. Uh, fun to cover. It's kind of interesting to do it right after the episode happened, too. Yep, but Dom, I'm, I'm squeezing your wrist, giving you the go-home signal. Let's call it yes, a night. Yes, you are. Let's call it. All right. That's it, buddy. <laughs> All right, we get, you got to hit the A, so do I. I got to get up at 6 in the morning, so. Yikes. Yikesy. All right. Good night, Talk everybody. Talk to you guys later.